So my talk today is about um, this question that's been at issue um, for, I guess, more than a century now about what the uh, the basic constituent order is in Daikampti, which is a, a, a Thai language that's spoken in, uh, in Myanmar as well as in Northeast India. And so this project is a continuation of work I presented a couple of years ago. Um, and so I... My feelings on the topic have changed a bit, but um, it's using sort of, I, I have I have data that I've continued to, to analyze and dig into deeper. And so um, I'm happy to share some of that with you. So I don't think, I think I'll go over this quickly as most people here should be familiar with, um, with the family and with uh, the, the Thai branch specifically, um, but I'll have them in the slides for people to consult later. So Thai, uh, the Southwestern Thai, branch is the one that houses Thai Um And the area where this, where it's spoken is, um, is roughly where this circle is. Of course, it's not entirely throughout that area, but that circle encompasses all of the, the disparate com speaker communities. Um, and so there really are three geographic areas where, um, where the language is spoken um, in Northeast India, um, across the Naga Hills in, um, in Sakai division, of, of Myanmar, um, and then in Kachin state of Myanmar. And so this is the area where I have um, been conducting field work for the last uh, six years. Um, so this is the area centered around um, uh, Kumpti Township. So Kumpti Township is in Sagain Division. Um, these red dots on the map are, um, so I, I think you're able to see my cursor, are you? able to see the cursor? I'm not, can someone <laughs> give me a nod? Okay, well, um, so this this dot here is the main town and the other four dots, the other red dots are um, the, are, 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 are other towns up and down the river. Um, and so this area here is a, is a sort of, um, it's, a, it's a cohesive community in that, you know, um, it, they're close enough that boat travel is frequent and they have uh, been in touch and basically been, uh, under uh, sort of consider themselves the same speaker community for the last um, uh, few hundred years at least. Okay. And so these red dots are all the places where I have uh, been to gather data personally. So I'll give you a little bit of an overview of what's been talked about uh, on Thai Company in the past. Um, prior to the 21st century, virtually all work was done in India. And so this goes to the, in fact, Company is interesting because some of the very earliest work on Thai languages. Um, is on Kumpti. So we have work from uh, Robinson, 1849, although the materials are actually from even earlier, from the 1830s, gathered by uh, Reverend Nathan Brown. Um, and so then there's a, actually a grammar of Kumpti from 1894 by Needham. Um, and Needham's data was used by Grierson in the, um, the survey of the languages of India in 1904. And um, interestingly, Kampti's claim to fame as far as linguistics in the world is that Greenberg in the 1960s cited Kampti as an exception to um, his claim to language universal four. Um, and we'll, just to recap briefly what that is, that states that if a language is uh, SOV in word order, then it should also have, uh, it should also have nouns preceding the modifier. Or, um, do I have that backwards? It should be um, right, and so the fact that it has uh, it has it, it, the claim is that because it's a subject object verb, and yet it has modifiers um, uh, following the noun, just like Thai does. Um, then, or and also any kind of modifier following a verb, also um, that breaks this language universal. So this is sort of uh, Kumpti's claim to fame using data from this early source. Um, a couple of other sources we have is Harris's 700-word vocabulary from the 1970s and Vidart's uh, larger vocabulary from the same period. Um, but it's still, we still don't actually, it's, it's still not very well documented, I guess is the, the short thing to say. As far as this century goes, um, Edmondson documented uh, a trip um, that included some company data in the mid nineties, although that data has not been uh, made available, although it's mentioned um, in summary form in some ways at Edmonds in 2008. Um, in Ingalls 2014, um, this is the first major work on Thai company in Myanmar, although the speakers that uh, the Ingalls consulted were 
uh, from Kachin State and resident in Thailand at the time. And so this project that I've been working on for the last several years is the, the first extended field work of Thai company actually performed in Myanmar. Um, and it's also the first um, work of substance, you know, other than sort of visiting and surveying a word list type of things um, that's happened in the Chinduin River Valley. So um, because most of the work that's been done um, over the last century or more has mainly been in Northeast India. It's worth noting of the two major projects in modern Myanmar, what are some of the key differences? So uh, Ingalls's um, dissertation and other papers uh, provide a, a really excellent source of data. So really ample data to get an eye on um, what Kampti is like. And so I'll point to a couple of differences um, for, for those who are curious um, that make that between the Chindran River Valley, uh, where I've done my work, and Kachin State, where Ingalls' speakers um, were from. So um, one of these is in addition to the being used as an accusative, um, in the Chindran River Valley, it's also used innovatively as, or sorry, as a locative, it's used innovatively as an accusative as well. So this is not obligatory, but it, um, it's something that I was, I was not able to locate in Ingalls' data, so it appears to be a novel usage. So where, whereas we would be familiar with, um, if anyone studying Thai languages would see sentences one and two as familiar. So meaning I have seen a tiger at the pier before. Um, so where the is this locative means at, it's the at part of at the pier, right? Or I raise dogs at home. Um, the innovative usage as a sort of accusative is so um, the me is not marking the accusative. The, the, the thing that is being seen is the bears. Um, and this is the same, the same form as in the locative or meaning I love my mother. So uh, the mother is the direct object of the verb love. So that's an interesting difference. Um, another thing that, that perhaps or basically calls for a lot of further study on um, just how similar or different these varieties are and whether they can even properly in the long term be called the same language is the, the, the focus of Ingalls's dissertation and much of his work is on this highly frequent marker, my, which is in fact, it appears to be totally absent um, from the variety that I work on. So this is um, this very high frequency marker of, um, of all sort of multi-purpose things. It's, it's noted in Needham as being dative, accusative, locative, uh, Wilai One refers it to it as a postpositional object marker. Um, Diller, 1992, Mori, so basically everyone has commented on it. And yet this, this group that identifies as Dai Kumpti and has had a presence in this area for um, a few hundred years and isn't geographically quite close to um, the Dai speakers across the, the Naga Hills in Northeast India um, seem to be missing this um, key feature. So that's, uh, I guess, a, a, a puzzle to point out. And then there are just these uh, various differences here between um, this high frequency form nai, and um, which is mentioned a lot in Ingalls. Um, and then the, these, it's either so it's, it's basically the, the jury is out on whether these uh, these forms that are high frequency in Chinduin Kamti, Thai Kamti, Na, and the uh, are just phonologically reduced versions of the same thing, or whether they come from some other source. Um, and so the, it's interesting in that they, it appears these things that are phonologically similar, if it is the source, we see them co-occurring, which makes it not straightforwardly obvious that we can call them the same thing. So we see sentences like in five, guang anna guang tsao, so the deer was a male deer. So this deer was a male deer, where we have something that it appears to be both a, a demonstrative of some kind and also a topic marker of some kind. Um, and so, um, the form fluctuates between nai and na, and na in Chindu and Kampi. So that would be something that um, would be a major difference as well, or an interesting difference. But the question at hand is whether the con basic constituent order of the languages, of the language has, has shifted. So as many will know, the basic order of um, the, throughout the family is subject, verb, object. Um, and so to see subject, object, verb, as has been claimed since the 19th century for Thai Kumpti, um, is interesting. And that's why 
Um, Greenberg cited it as um, you know, uh, uh, as being exceptional because, with he, as he wrote in 1963 and then again in 66, with overwhelmingly greater than chance frequency, languages with normal SOB order are post-positional. Right. Yes, uh, that's the uh, that's the the rule. And so, because Comte is SOV and is prepositional, this is seen as being um, unusual. Okay, so what else has been said? Um, so let me just go back here. Uh, so we have right. So we have these early observations. Needham, Needham was the source for Grierson. Was the source for Greenberg. And so, since that early source, what's been said is Wheelie one in Wheelie one in 1986 said SOV is the dominant word order in Comte while in other thai dialects, SVO is the dominant one. Diller 1992 states, the general impression is a very pragmatically controlled configuration. Maury in 2005 wrote, both orders are still found. Pragmatic factors are more important in determining the constituent orders than any basic syntactic ordering. And finally, um, Ingalls in 2014 writes, Comte exhibits a basic SOV word order as generally demonstrated with the data in this dissertation. And so it's a, um, it's no doubt the case that language contact comes into play in all cases. In both communities, um, for multiple centuries now, although they are geographically disparate, they're surrounded by different SOV speaking languages. So in Myanmar, Burmese and other, uh, and tibeto burman languages um, that they interact with could be a source, or obviously a source of contact, and Assamese and potentially other languages in the area in Northeast India. And so people have often noted that this is um, quite likely a, a language contact situation. Um, so I won't, uh, won't belabor this point too much, but um, I'll now talk a little bit about some of the sociolinguistic factors um, for this specific variety that I have done work on. So to give a, a sort of better idea of the situation. So in this area, the, the, the variety that I am calling Chindwin Thai Kumpi, that is Thai Kumpi spoken in the Chindwin River Valley. Um, it's the, the only major source of transportation between the villages is rivers. During particular times of year, there are sort of uh, barely traversable roads, um, but river, the river remains the, um, the main area between the town and the nearest villages and the only way of travel between the town and um, and the more far, far flung villages. And so even a village that, that is 10 or 20 kilometers away, um, you, you have only uh, river travel. Of course, that's how it's been in this area for, uh, for a very long time. Um, there are maybe 7,000 residents in these 12 five villages in the area of which I've been to, to five. Um, and there are of course speakers in neighboring township. Oops, I'm sorry. My, my screen is blanking out, are you able to? Okay, sorry, technical flub on my end. Hopefully that still shows on your end. Um, just the number of residents is not the same as the number of speakers, however. Um, some of these people identify as Thai Lang or are referred to as other, by others as Thai Lang. So this is something where um, that this needs to be teased out further. Um, exactly what the, the languages um, spoken in the area are and what they're... Um, how they should be classified and identified. Uh, but also multilingualism is universal in this area with Burmese. Um, there's a um, some but not substantial intermarrying with tibeto burman speakers. This is what they the locals call Naga, the Naga languages. Um, and also, of course, there's a, a relatively um, be, be a high degree of intermarrying with, um, with ethnic Burmans and Burmese speakers. So this is becoming more and more common, especially in the town, in the main town. And so literacy is fairly low, um, and they use an adaptation of Shan script, so not the Kumpti script that's used in the other two main uh, Thai Kumpti areas. This is an interesting difference. They've been sort of geographically um, separated, and use of the language has been locally uh, criminalized until very recently, in the last five years or so. Those restrictions have been lifted, and so um, in many ways, this Thai Kumpti community has operated under very different sociolinguistic conditions than um, the other two main areas. Um, according to local records, the understanding is that um, that they migrated from Assam across the Naga Hills in the 18th century. Um, this is, as I said, the local tradition uh, says this, and that ultimately they would have um, come from 
uh, from Kachin State area some number of centuries before that. Uh, and they were also sort of the governing uh, group in the area until the 1940s, uh, but in recent decades um, have uh, sort of been under uh, Burman government uh, rule. So let me just talk quickly about the data I've gathered. So I have these, these sentence corpora. Um, and so there's a variety of things. The first is this corpus where I have um, 37 speakers ages 12 to 78 from five different villages who um, answered target questions. Um, and then there are, so they provided something like 1800 unique sentences. And then there's a corpus of assorted texts which is not fully analyzed. So this is naturalistic data. Um, like folk tales, folk songs, the sort of pear story and frog story things. And this is an example of what the sentence corpus elicitation was. So asking frame sentences around. Um, so there are four contrastive tones. And so four words for each of the tones. Um, the reasons why they're numbered one, two, four, and six, don't worry about that. There are only four. It's because th these are numbered orthographically based on the Shan script. And so they, the locals refer to them by numbers, even though they only use a subset of the total number of possible. So uh, tone one is unmarked and two, four, and six are different tone marks. Okay, there's a, a high rising tone, a low falling tone, a high falling tone, and a mid-level tone. Okay, so these frame questions um, were asked to elicit um, certain words with particular tones for a tonal study. And then these sentences have then been analyzed subsequently for um, their constituent order. Okay, so let's look at how it actually looks. So um, of the roughly 1,750 unique sentences in, this, in the Daikumpti sentence corpus, um, we've coded 1,160 of those for constituent order. Um, and verb precedes object, uh, in fact, only 82 times out of the... Okay, so let me jump back to where I was. So I, just, I was just looking at um, the instances. Um, so we can already see, um, actually, let me. Sorry, one sec. Okay. Can you see it okay? All right. Um, give me a sign if, if everything is, anything is not. Okay. So. I was just showing that we, we already see just in raw numbers um, a large gap between the number of um, object uh, uh, OV versus VO um, type structures where OV is, is much more frequent. Um, and so I, I, what I did do, I, I looked at a few um, sort of sample verbs that are highly frequent, which I call core transitive, a couple of core transitive verbs and then ambiguous transitive. So something that's core transitive, something like to see or to eat, and then ambiguously transitive would be something like to like, or to sao could be seen as um, you, are, you are in theory being uh, pleased by the thing that you like if you analyze that. Okay, but just looking at a few, a couple of examples um, for to see, uh, 495 instances of see in the sentence corpus. Um, we have 354 of them are um, in sentence final position. So we have han gao, um, and where gao is this uh, post-verbal modifier uh, similar to, to the pre-verbal Thai, Thai word kui. So han gao means kui hin. And han ma, which is just a, a recent past marker, han sao, which is just the verb with an honorific. So I call all of these sentence final because the thing that follows them is either a post-verbal modifier or a honorific of some kind. Okay. Um, and so the vast majority of the time that these verbs appear, it is in sentence final position. Okay, and so an example would be sentence six, kai kai ne di hang hang kai han ma sao. I saw the chicken eggs at the chicken coop. Okay, so for jin, uh, we have 218 instances of, of eat in the corpus, and uh, half of those, more than half of those, are in um, just this jin uh, dao post verbal modifier, I have, I have eaten whatever before. So they were maybe talking about galangal or whatever this, the word we were eliciting was. Um, and 55 of those have this recent past and 27 are in some sort of sentence final serial verb construction. So between those, um, that is um, uh, virtually all of those, okay? 
if that adds up to more than 218, so I should check the math on that. <laughs> but an example, so that means I pounded the gallon gold bud and ate it. Okay, and then we have lots of ambiguous transitives, and so the ambiguous transitives are the ones where we actually see the most uh, sort of straightforward and interesting variation. So I like chicken eggs, I like a particular kind of fish, particular kind of beans. We see both sort of SOV and SVO where preceding and following. And so this is, could be seen as pragmatically controlled or lacking in some sort of basic order. Um, but it's not just uh, corpus data. So here's where I hope the audio will come through. Um, there was, um, I gathered word list data from nine speakers as well. So this is a 436 item word list, um, six folks of different ages who live in the main town and three from certain villages. Um, and the word list are maybe where we would typically expect the least VOOV variation um, because they're out of context. But in fact, verbs that take obligatory objects like to bathe, uh, where the obligatory object is water, and to eat, where the most often obligatory object is rice, um, we did, I did see a lot of variation. And so that's, let's see if I can play an example. So see if you can, <laughs> if you can hear the speaker who does not follow this, this is the game of one of these things is not like the other. Let's see if this works. <laughs> okay, could you hear that? Okay, so the la if you can hear that, the last speaker, everyone says, apnam, 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 and the last speaker says, nam, ap. Um, and so if the prompt is a word list or it's a word out of context and they have both, they have the, um, the Burmese uh, word to go by, which is the, the way that I, we elicited most of the data, um, yeah, okay, so um, this speaker very consistently um, had the reverse order from the others, and occasionally you could hear discussion and he would present it both ways, but the point is that um, even out of context, um, at least some speakers seem to volunteer uh, the obligatory object preceding the verb, so that's sort of more evidence for things moving more towards OV. So just some discussion then before I wrap up. Um, the main uh, question then is, are these SVO things we see in the corpus, what Ingalls calls SVO remnants? So sort of generalized activities more likely to be encoded as VO, indefinite and nonspecific. Well, um, at the very least, we can say that uh, Chindwin Thai Kumpti does seem to have definite specific VO usage. So for instance, so my father is working at home, um, and so het long, uh, it, uh, it's an obligatory object, so it's potentially, um, or it's potentially different, but it does seem to be a specific definite usage. Um, and interestingly, we also see VO and OV sort of commingling in serial verb constructions. Uh, the, the tab spacing got a little messed up here, but where it says, so pangnin means to sort of bury with dirt, and het comes at the end. So, so you're doing the burying of dirt. It's some, some sort of uh, causative. So it's either, uh, whether you interpret it as a causative directly or just the verb to do, um, they're the same form. And so interestingly, we, it appears to be V-O-O-V sort of combing. Now there's always the possibility that the way that I've gathered the sentence corpora, that the sentence corpus data uh, introduced a task effect. So by asking by, asking multiple sentences about a particular noun target, um, it could elicit uh, topic fronting of that noun. So if at the direct object, you're asking, what do you like? What do you eat? Maybe they're, they're mentioning the, the noun first. Um, and so that is a possibility that I can't entirely rule out on its face. Um, so I'll just mention that here. Um, but um, there's, I'm not convinced that that's the case. So um, anyway, I'll, I will, uh, move on past that for now. And I'll just conclude by saying, so the new data from, this new data from uh, to the Chindon River Valley gives us 1,700 um, more sentences, 10,000 more words um, from this dialect that is previously not entirely undocumented, but uh, undocumented, but nearly so. And certainly as many of the things I've observed about the, the, the this dialect are, are, are different from all the other previous work. Um, and, oops, and yet it's still difficult to tease apart what basic constituent order means. Um, so certainly contact is playing a major role here. But 
we've sort of been arguing about this for more than a century now. So if it's really a language contact effect that's in progress, um, maybe even if it's moving more towards um, SOV, after a century, you have to sort of talk about maybe it's actually in some sort of stable state where it's not actually changing. It's just it's still in this state where both um, both orders are, are possible. OK. Um, and so the main missing piece now is sort of further study of naturalistic corpora. Um, and so I have those texts, but they um, are to present significantly more um, work that needs to be done. Um, so I will I'll leave you with my, my thoughts that um, I'm, I'm more convinced than I was two years ago that if we were to call something basic, that we would want to call it the SOV, the basic order, because it's by far the most frequent order. Uh, but we still see SVO and sort of many uh, SVO type things still peppered throughout the data. Okay, so I will, thanks to my undergrad research assistants and to the funders of this work. And thank you all for, for listening.